recording in progress. There we go. And I'll hand it over to Laura and Ariel. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for choosing to be here tonight. And thanks also to the Kensington Library and to Kara uh, for hosting us. So my name is Laura Callen. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I've lived in Kensington since 2011, and I still marvel every time I look at the bay from Blake Garden and look at the hills from the school trail. Um, I marvel at my good fortune um, to live here. Um, for the past several years, I've been helping to organize um, non-Native folks to work for Indigenous sovereignty, and I do that work with a couple different groups. Uh, that work is really deeply shaped for me by my identity as a settler on this land. Uh, my ancestors having come from Europe, um, Romania, Poland, and France. And I've also, I also come to this work as a white person, a Jew, a parent, and with class privilege. Um, tonight, I am here as a core team member of Good Guest Kensington. And I'll say more about that group in a minute, but first I wanna invite Ariel to introduce himself. Thank you so much, Laura, and thank you, um, Cara, for hosting us. It's um, a pleasure to be with everyone this evening. Uh, my name is Ariel Lucky, and I use he and him pronouns. I am the development director at Segorate Land Trust, and I'm also an organizer with Jews on Ohlone Land. And, um, yeah, I'm also a father and an artist and a community member. And um, my people are Ashkenazi Jewish and also white settlers and immigrants. Um, and I have, uh, I'm born and raised in Oakland. I've lived in the East Bay all my life, what I now understand uh, as Huchin, unceded Lashon Ohlone land. And I'm really excited about the work that's happening in Kensington to organize folks to, to um, plug into all of these um, various activities. So looking forward to the conversation tonight. So tonight's program is organized by Good Guest Kensington. Uh, we are a group of Kensington residents who are inviting our neighbors to live as good guests on stolen indigenous land, including by paying the Shiumi land tax. Um, and we'll talk more about Shuumi and other actions that you can take later on in the, the evening. Um, Ariel and Liz Ma initiated Good Guest Kensington back in February. Um, there are several folks here tonight uh, who are part of our group. So if we just take a second and if you're connected to Good Guest Kensington in some way, you wanna give a wave or you can put a, an icon into your, your Zoom window Great to see everybody. Um, so there's a core team of six people. Um, we meet monthly and we share updates and opportunities to get involved um, through an email list. Our most recent projects are asking local businesses and community organizations to display a poster about this work. Maybe you've seen them around town and we're providing resources to the Hilltop Elementary School uh, community families and teachers. Um, this is our first public program, and I'm really glad that y'all get to be a part of it. Tonight is an invitation to begin to think about ourselves as guests on someone else's land and imagine how we might live here from that understanding in right relationship with Indigenous people. Tonight is also an introduction. Uh, we will only scratch the surface of some big, complex, and sometimes difficult ideas and we hope that the conversation continues. Um, I encourage you as you're here tonight to just be curious and open to try on some new ideas, maybe suspend judgment and uh, to use your imagination. At the end of the program, we'll drop a link in the chat um, that will take you to a resource sheet that we've prepared. Um, it'll include links to the organizations that we talk about tonight and a lot of other materials so you can keep learning and take action as well. And I'm going to turn it over to Ariel, who's going to give a land acknowledgement. Thank you, Laura. Um, so we always want to start by um, grounding ourselves in where we are. Um, and for me, that 
in, in part starts in my body. So I want to um, invite you as you feel comfortable to take a breath with us all together, breathing in and breathing out. So despite the fact that we are gathered in this interstellar online Zoom reality, uh, you know, of, of the ether world, we are also each in our own physical bodies and on the earth. So I want to invite you to hold the awareness of where you are in relationship to the ground and the land, the land literally underneath your feet or your chair or wherever you are, right? Um, are you on the first floor? Are you outside? Are you on the second floor? Like try to feel down into the ground directly below you. So I am right now in a place called Huchen, which is the Chochenyo name of the Lashan Ohlone people for this place. Huchen encompasses uh, six East Bay cities, Oakland, Berkeley, Albany, Piedmont, Emeryville, and Alameda. And um, this land has been continuously lived in and stewarded and taken care of by the Lashan Ohlone people for thousands of years, um, hundreds and hundreds of generations of people who have lived here and still live here um, who call this place home. That incredible history and culture was violently interrupted um, by the colonization that we'll hear a little bit more about shortly. The Spanish fishing system, the Mexican ranchos, and um, the gold rush in the American era. Um, if Ellie, if you can go ahead and keep muted, that would be that would be great. Thank you. So for me, part of the land acknowledgement is about acknowledging and recognizing and knowing and learning the about the violence that's happened here, the ugly brutality of the colonization and the genocide that happened to Ohlone people. And reckoning with that and sitting with that and feeling that. And it's also about acknowledging and celebrating the beauty and the power of this place. The ways that the redwood trees and the oak trees and the fog and the rivers that roll down from the hills into the bay all shape this place. And it's about an engagement with the relationship that we might have or might grow into with the indigenous community who lives on this land. Karina Gould, the Confederated Villages of Lashan spokesperson, talks about land acknowledgments as grounded in relationship and in grounded in action and in grounded in a living document that is growing and changing. So every time we do it, it feels different. It's a little bit different because it's right now and it's right here. So here we are. Now we are. Welcome to this moment. Welcome to this place. And let's have this conversation together. So next slide. Thank you so much, Ariel, for grounding us together and to the land in such a beautiful way. And just to invite you to let that settle for a couple more seconds, maybe take another breath. So being in solidarity with indigenous people of this place means having our own meaningful relationship to this land, it means caring about it in a deep and personal way. Um, one way that I feel connected to this place is that my children were born here, are being raised here. You know, they're being shaped um, by the extraordinary tapestry of landscapes that are here, the earthquakes and the smoke days, um, the food and the music and all the communities fighting for justice. Um, you know, this place will always be part of them no matter where they may go in their lives. Um, so now I'd like to invite all of you to pause and to think about your connection to this place where you live. So we're gonna take 30 seconds 
And again, I just invite you to think to yourself to reflect on that question. How do you feel connected to this place where you live? So 30 seconds, enjoy this reflection time. If you feel like you'd wanna share something in the chat, please feel free to do so, but no pressure. We'll take about five more seconds. Wonderful. Thank you for engaging with that question um, and Camden's sharing that I feel connected when I see the butterflies in our garden and my kids playing in the street in front of our home and when we take walks on the paths to Tilden. Beautiful. Thanks, Camden. Um, so uh, next slide, Ariel. So Kensington is located in Huchin, as Ariel was saying, uh, the territory of the Lashan Ohlone people. The Lashan people have lived in the territory of Huchin since the beginning of time, as Ariel was saying, thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Um, they never ceded or sold their land. They never left, they are still here today. Um, the Lashan people are one of eight different Ohlone tribes that are in the Bay Area. Um, their ancestors were directly enslaved at the Mission San Jose um, in Fremont and Mission Dolores in San Francisco. Next slide. So the colored map shows the indigenous territory names of the region. Um, and you can see Huchin sort of on the left side running from top to bottom, encompassing again, roughly the East Bay. And then the black and white map shows the indigenous language groups of this area. And Ariel mentioned Chochenyo uh, as the language of the Ohlone people. And again, you can see where that is and how that corresponds to the territory of Huchin. So this is a lot of information that I've been having to learn and, and remember, um, you know, different ways of um, thinking about indigenous people, their territory uh, groups and language groups and how they name themselves. So it helps me sometimes to remember the people are the Lashan Ohlone, the territory is Huchin and the language is Chochenyo. Next slide. Before colonization, you know, indigenous people had their own fully developed cultures and civilizations, and this place was profoundly different than it is today. Karina Gould, the tribal spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashan, says, if you can imagine 200 years ago, there was an abundance in our territory. There was not even a concept of hunger or homelessness. And I've heard Karina also talk about the creeks here being so thick with salmon that you could walk on their backs from one side to the other. And that this abundance was possible because people lived in reciprocity with the land and with all beings, um, with reverence and knowledge of the land and the waters and the plants and the animal life. Lashana Ohlone people practiced deep care. They stewarded the land in a way that would ensure abundance into the future. Indigenous people built shell mounds all around the bay. Uh, these were burial grounds where ancestors were laid to rest, um, layers of soil and shell from the shellfish that they would eat. Um, the shell mounds are older than the pyramids in Egypt and most of the major cities in the world. And at one time there were over 425 shell mounds ringing the bay and that map that you see um, shows the location of, of those shell mounds. No shell mounds remain intact today. The oldest shell mound is located at what is now the 4th Street shopping area in Berkeley. Um, it is the site of the first human settlement on the shore of the San Francisco Bay, uh, established about 5,000 years ago. The Lashana Ohlone people and their allies are fighting right now to protect what is left of that sacred space. And Ariel's going to tell us a little bit more about that um, shortly. Next slide. 
So I'm gonna to touch on colonization in this one slide. That is utterly inadequate, uh, but it's all we have time for tonight. So I urge you to learn more about this essential history, which is still not fully taught even in our schools. Um, the resource sheet that we'll share um, can point you to some excellent materials um, that you can look into. So the colonization of California's indigenous people happened really differently um, than colonization happened in other places on Turtle Island. Um, indigenous people in California were colonized by three different countries, one wave right after the other. Um, Spain colonized this area starting in 1769 and built um, the missions using the indigenous people as slave labor. Um, then Mexico came in 1821 and they created ranchos, uh, which also enslaved indigenous people. And then when the United States took over in 1850, um, it was a different type of violence. Uh, there was a genocide, um, an explicit direction from the state to kill indigenous people, to exterminate and eliminate them. And there were other ways of erasing indigenous life um, such as boarding schools and assimilating indigenous people. Um, this quote from California's first governor gives you a sense of, again, how state sanctioned and explicit it was, um, the goal of exterminating indigenous people. That a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the two races until the Indian race becomes extinct and must be expected. In 1769, there were over 310,000 native people in California. And by 1900, there were less than 20,000. In 2019, Governor Newsom called this a genocide um, committed by the state of California. And he issued a public apology. Um, and just this year, a Truth and Healing Council started work to try and look into this really brutal history and begin a healing process with indigenous people. So now we're gonna hear Karina Gould talk about some of this history. Um, we're gonna drop into a talk that she gave last year, um, right at the point where she starts to describe um, what happened during Mexican rule, um, which is actually one of the lesser known parts of um, the colonization story. And this is about five minutes long. Mexico came and stole the land a second time after the Spanish, um, and they continued the enslavement of the indigenous people. And the way that this happened was interesting because our ancestors, when the Spanish missions closed down, um, they, uh, Mexico had won its independence from Spain and decided that the Spanish churches had too much land. And so they squished down the land that the churches held and gave out huge swaths of land to uh, Spanish soldiers. So people like Peralta and Bernal and Vallejo and many other people that came and were uh, soldiers were given thousands and thousands of acres of land. And my ancestors quite literally went from being uh, prisoners and slaves at the missions to prisoners um, and slaves on these ranchos. And so the land came with the Indians on it. And we don't have a lot of history about what happened to, the, to our ancestors, except we know that they worked on the ranchos for the people that now had the land. There was nowhere else to go because our land was literally given away to someone else. And so um, went to, uh, to working from them. In the Bay Area in the East Bay, where I currently live, I live in my traditional territory of Huchin on the border of Irgin. Um, El, um, the Rancho de San Antonio or the Peralta land was given and, and that's from San Leandro to uh, about Albany, California and my ancestors um, were enslaved here at this time uh, during this period of time um, and you can see that there was Sobrante and Panol and other places people that owned these lands now um, in uh, during this rant, land grant 
1848, Mexico and America had a war and the land that was, was stolen for a third time by the United States. And instead of slavery, it was now about mass extermination. And so there was this treaty, the Treaty of Guadalupe de Hidalgo. And in the Treaty of Guadalupe de Hidalgo, it said not only were the land grants supposed to be um, uh, enforced and they were supposed to keep their land, land was supposed to be given back to the native people. And true to its form, the United States government broke this treaty as well. California was created and some of the very first laws of California made it illegal to be Indian in California. California spent $1.4 million backed by the federal government killing California native people, $5 a head and 25 cents an ear. And so our ancestors had to go into hiding. There were, um, everyone came, you hear about our ancestors in fourth grade history about the Ohlone people or the Bay Miwok people or the Plains Miwok people in the Bay Area. And then we learn about how they used to dress and how they used to eat and how they used to do a lot of things. And then we go rushing into fifth grade into the gold rush and we don't hear about native people anymore. And we definitely don't hear about the history of our people being hunted down. We don't hear about the fact that our, there were uh, laws also intact. There were vagrancy laws. And this, this makes me really weary right now when we talk about the vagrancy laws that happened to my ancestors and the thousands of people that are now in our territory that are living without shelter and the laws that are being passed that incriminate them. So the vagrancy laws in California were against native people and it allowed, to have, allowed slavery to happen. Uh, because a native person could not speak against a white person in a court of law. Uh, they could be taken into a court of law, a native person could be taken into a court of law, claimed to be vagrant, and the court could give this rancher, this person, this human being, uh, for up to 25 years um, as free labor, as long as they could feed and clothe them. People would go into villages of native people and kill off the adults and get the bounty for their heads and ears and take the little children into town and sell them off $300 for a little girl, $180 to $200 for a little boy. And here there began a different kind of disconnect of native families um, during that time. So my ancestors did quite literally go into hiding and pretended that they were Mexican and they lived on a ranch in Pleasanton, California very close to where the Alameda County Fairgrounds are today. So that's really painful history, truth to have to hear. Um, it's important to hear and it's, it's difficult. So I'm gonna take another breath and let that all sink in. And we'll move to the next slide. And let's place Kensington uh, into this history. Uh, this map is from a book that I bought uh, right here in Kensington called Kensington Past and Present published in 2017. Um, and it's so interesting because we can really map um, Kensington's history onto the history of colonization that we just reviewed. Um, so during the Spanish rule in, in 1772, you can see that there's a Spanish expedition, the Bajes expedition, um, represented by those arrows. And that expedition is um, mapping the area and it snakes right up through Kensington and then north. And then if we move to Mexican rule, um, we can see that Kensington is located on Rancho San Pablo land, which was created from the Castro land grant. So one of the land grants that Karina is referring to, um, this was given to a man named uh, Castro. And then in 1850, again, we know that California becomes a state and Kensington is founded, is created and named in 1917. So this is still indigenous land and places significant to Lashana Ohlone people still exist. And we're gonna listen to another um, excerpt 
um, Karina Gould, and she's going to tell us about a few of them. We are still trying to find our way home. Oh, it's not moving. There we go. Berkeley has a sacred landscape that no one talks about because it's covered by asphalt and, and uh, buildings now. You can't see a landscape really. You can see Campanile. You can see uh, you can see some other things in Berkeley, but you can't see this natural landscape of sacredness that my ancestors had. And this is just one place. You know, I think that people don't realize that there's sacred places all over the Bay Area that you don't have access to because you don't know what you're look for anymore uh, because there's a disconnect of, of what has happened. I've been fighting for the West Berkeley Shell Mound for four and a half years. And this is the oldest of the 425 shell mounds that ring the Bay Area. Up above there is Indian Rock. And Indian Rock is a place of ceremony where Mortar Park is and it's in a residential area and people use it to learn how to rock climb. And it was a place of reverence that looked into our Western gate. And if you come across this to this triad, you go over to UC Berkeley. And you see Berkeley where Faculty Glade is and, and underneath the faculty building and the stadium where, Sarah, where uh, village sites and ceremonial places along Strawberry Creek uh, that went straight down to the West Berkeley Shell Mound. These, this triad is just one of many in the Bay Area that are invisible because our lands have been covered over by asphalt. And I'm going to turn it over to Ariel. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, I just want to acknowledge again how much this is, <laughs> how much information this is, how much uh, meaning these stories carry, and um, you know how crazy it is to try to have this conversation in just an hour. So um, we're doing it anyway. We're going to try to have this conversation. But um, just to acknowledge, you know, even and, and I know I've heard this information before and every time I hear it, I get hit again. Um, and I, you know, and I ask myself, you know, I grew up here. I went to school here. I've lived here all my life. I didn't learn any of this until recently. Right. Why? Why don't our kids know the history of the land that they they live on? Why don't we talk about this? Why is this so invisibilized? So um, part of the the work that we do at Segorate Land Trust and that I'm excited that good guest Kensington is is partnering with us to do this work is just education, um, just telling the, the truth and telling the history of, of this place um, with an honest um, eye and uh, open heart and, and, and open eyes about what has happened here and what is continuing to happen here. And on that, from that place of honesty and real reckoning with the past, um, we can dream together about um, what the future of the Bay Area might look like, what kind of communities and what kind of place we want to be. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about rematriation. Um, this is the definition that Segorate Land Trust uses. Um, rematriation is indigenous women-led work to restore relationships between indigenous people and their ancestral land. Rematriation honors matrilineal societies and lineages, ways 
of tending to the land. And, um, you know, you, you might have seen our signs or stickers that say rematriate the land. Um, and part of, you know, what, what I, I'm learning into what that means is um, reconnecting uh, our lives to the land that we live on and um, integrating these, this history and, you know, finding our role into it. What does it mean for me? Um, what does it mean for us as East Bay residents? What, do, what does it mean for us as a society to engage in this work? Um, so let, let, me, uh, let me go to Segorite Land Trust. Um, for those of you who haven't heard about it, um, it's an urban indigenous women-led land trust that facilitates the return of indigenous land to indigenous people. And very, very briefly, I mean, I really encourage you to check out um, the website, which will be referenced on the resource sheet at the end of the of the workshop. Um, but there's a lot of information on our website. Um, <clears throat> Segorite was started by Karina Gould, who you've heard before, um, who is Lashawn Ohlone, the um, tribal spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashawn and um, co-founder and director of Segorite Land Trust, along with her um, old friend and comrade Janella LaRose, who is Shoshone Bannock. They have been um, really doing grassroots organizing in the urban indigenous community for over two decades, primarily centered around protecting sacred sites. And um, Segorite really comes out of that, that work, um, the relationships, the, the prayer, and um, and the inspiration from the ancestors that that work comes out of and kind of that activist legacy. Uh, Segorite was started in 2012 and um, has been growing and growing and growing and um, is really centered in both Lashana Ohlone leadership um, as well as intertribal indigenous community. Um, the Bay Area is one of the large, it has one of the largest populations actually of urban indigenous folks because of relocation policies uh, in the 1950s and 60s from the federal government that pushed folks off reservations all over the country um, into urban centers as a project of assimilation. So there are now many families that are generations deep who have been in the Bay Area for a long time who are not Ohlone, but are indigenous and call this place home. So Segorite um, is really sitting on, on um, and serving that foundation. Uh, there's a lot of dreams uh, of rematriation from Karina and Janela's vision um, that include uh, rebuilding a land base for urban indigenous people. The Lashana Ohlone uh, don't have federal recognition. They don't have a reservation. They don't have a rancheria. There is not a land base for indigenous people here in the Bay Area. Um, and so, you know, Janela talks about how important that is, the connection to land um, for everyone and in, for indigenous people in particular. These are some of the, the um, dreams and work that Segorite Land Trust does. We um, currently uh, take care of several different land sites throughout the East Bay and um, are starting to develop uh, permanently affordable housing for indigenous people, um, ceremonial spaces, office and program spaces, uh, a place to put the stolen Ohlone ancestral remains that are being held captive by UC Berkeley and San Francisco State and other institutions. Um, the vision is to put those back into the ground in a, in a sacred way, um, to grow and gather indigenous food and medicine, to restore land and waterways. So there are, it's a really holistic and um, to me, very, very personally inspiring vision. And part of what feels so generous um, and so human is Karina's invitation for all of us to join her in the creation, join Zagorate and partner with them in the creation of that vision and dream of rematriation for the Bay Area um, to make it a better place for everyone. 
part of what supports the work at Segorate Land Trust is um, an initiative called the Shumi Land Tax. And Shumi is the Chochenyo word for gift. And the Shumi Land Tax is, is an invitation for all of us who are not indigenous, who live on this land, to make an annual financial contribution to Segorate Land Trust to support the work of rematriation. And part of that is about acknowledging the colonization and genocide and violence that has happened here and recognizing that our lives are only possible, right? The roads we drive on, the houses we live in, the schools that our kids go to, the grocery stores, the parks, all of these things, our society are built upon that legacy of stolen land and genocide and colonization. And we have a relationship to it, whether we know about it or not, whether you know we feel connected or, to it or not, this is the history of this land. And our lives, our way of lives now would not be possible without that history. So part of it is acknowledging that. And the other part of it is an invitation to participate in the transformation of that legacy, to support the healing and justice work that the indigenous women who lead Segorate Land Trust are doing and to be a part of building this vision for a Bay Area that is much more balanced, much more rooted in the land, much more um, healthy and sustainable for everyone, where no one is hungry and no one is homeless because we are all taking care of each other and we are um, living in better reciprocity and right relationship with the land. So um, we have, uh, there's a calculator on the Segorate Land uh, Trust website and a lot more information. I encourage you to check it out. Um, but Shumi Land Tax is one way, one very, very clear way that those of us who are not indigenous can support this work. I also want to add that um, Shumi is not just about money and making a financial contribution. It's in invitation to um, be in relationship to the land and to the indigenous community in a different kind of way, to learn these histories and to get to know people and to show up um, at the West Berkeley Shell Mound, at other events and actions, and to think about how we can leverage the relationships, the institutions we're a part of, the technical expertise, whatever we might have that could be useful for this movement of rematriation and land back that is happening here in the Bay Area and around the country, for us to think about what can, what can we bring, what can we offer? I, I think that, you know, for me as a white person and what, thinking about white people, thinking about settlers and the, the extraction in, inherent in colonization, that there has been so much that's been taken and taken and taken and taken. Land that's been taken, lives that have been taken, um, names of places, cultural appropriation, right? There's just so much that's been taken. And I really think that it's time to um, reorient ourselves to think about what we can give, what we can um, offer freely and in a good way. Um, to transform the imbalance that has been created in our society. Segorte does a lot of work with cities and um, different uh, public education initiatives. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, you can see Chochenyo Park, which was just renamed this year by the city of Alameda. A year ago, it was named Andrew Jackson Park, a year and a half ago. And after the um, Black Lives Matter uprisings that happened, the city realized needed to rename the park um, and worked with the tribe of Confederated Villages of Lashawn to name it after the language that's been spoken here for thousands of years. Um, the city of Berkeley recently added Ohlone territory to their welcome signs. Um, in the lower right hand corner, you see a, a snapshot of Oakway Park in Richmond, which is a park that um, Segorate is stewarding and growing traditional uh, medicinal plants. And in the bottom here, you can see, uh, you know, Kensington neighbors 
uh, Albany uh, raising the Confederated Villages of Lashawn flag just last month on Indigenous Peoples Day. So these are just a few of the many ways um, that Segorte Land Trust is engaging um, with schools, with cities, with um, you know all different kinds of community-based organizations and and the culture just in general around um, recognizing for everybody to recognize Ohlone people are still here. They are still alive. They are still um, working hard to take care of their ancestral lands and um, are uh, an important part of our community and um, to push back on the invisibilization that has been happening for the last a uh, couple hundred years. So Ariel, I'm gonna play this last clip that we have of Karina who speaks just so movingly about the invitation to live here as, as good guests. So if you just give me a second to find my place in that video and we'll share it with you. work the land with people from all walks of life because we're not the only ones here. And the healing is not just for us, it's for everybody that lives in our territory. You see, we wanna be good hosts, but we need good guests. And fourth graders really know what it means to be a good guest because as adults, as parents, as grandparents, as aunties and uncles, we, we, we tell little guys how they're supposed to behave when they're somebody's guest. When you go to your best friend's house or your grandma's house, how do you behave yourself? And fourth graders say, oh, that's easy. We don't touch things that aren't ours. We say thank you and please. We ask permission. We don't break things. And that's pretty easy for us to understand as adults to tell our children. But as adults, we forget that we're in someone else's home this is someone else's territory and that we have responsibilities for our guests, but we can't be good hosts if we don't have good guests. It's living in reciprocity with each other. It's learning how to ask permission and not to break things. It's learning how to be in relationship with First Nations people. We are working on bringing back our language and our cultural revitalization through the work of Segorite. We are able to, uh, to, to take up our tuli again and to teach ourselves and others about the names of our medicines. We work on our land with people of all walks of life to create a better place. And as we begin to work the land and we begin to sing and we begin to share food together and medicines together, our community grows stronger. You see, we're still here. We're not the pictures of the past. This is a small portion of our tribe and we still stand together on our lands. We still sing our songs. We still do our language. We still have obligations to our sacred sites. And we need everyone that lives in our territory to be good guests so that we can do the work that we are supposed to do. Is the prayers are not just for us. They are prayers for the people that live in our territories now. Our future generation is here. These are three of my four grandchildren. If we don't do this work, and we, if we don't do this work together, the genocide, the genocidal project that was planned for us will be complete. And as a grandmother, as a leader of our tribe, I can't see that happen. And so I depend on everyone that's listening to share these stories and to be good guests and to work with us to create a better world for the next seven generations and beyond. Thank you so much for your attention, for maybe stretching to hold some of these ideas. 
some of this information, some of these possibilities. And we have about 10 minutes to have some conversation. So I invite anybody who would like to share a thought, um, a reaction, reflection, question, I'll just go ahead and take yourself off mute. So I see a question here in the chat from Irene. Other than giving Shaumi, what are some other ways we can get involved in supporting Good Guest Kensington and the Segorite Land Trust? Ariel, you wanna take that first and then I'll add? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I'll try to speak loud because I, I understand I've not been as loud. Something's going with the audio. Um, thank you so much for that question. That's a fabulous question. Uh, there are, I think, lots and lots of things to do and ways to support and get involved. Um, joining Good Guest Kensington is a fantastic option. Uh, there's monthly meetings and different things happening, and, and Laura can tell you more about that. Um, at Segorite, of course, before COVID, we had all kinds of community events and work parties on the land sites and all kinds of, you know, ways to show up physically. That has changed a lot. Um, but again, I encourage you to check out the website. There's a lot of resources. We have a recommended reading list. Um, there's a lot of videos and articles. So one of the most important ways I think all of us can um, engage is just learning. Get a group of friends together and read a book or watch a um, video and discuss it. Um, there's also various um, it's a lot of different things to do around the West Berkeley Shell Mound. I, I dropped the um, link in the chat, but that's an ongoing campaign to save a 2.2 um, acre uh, site down on 4th Street, which is the last um, open space portion of, the, of that Ohlone Village and, and Shell Mound. And that's so close, right? It's just down the road, really. Um, and there's lots of other ways to show up and, and um, support initiatives and campaigns um, of indigenous people, both here in the Bay and all over the country and the world, right? There's uh, line three um, protests that are happening in the Midwest and um, all sorts of sacred sites that need our um, support. So thank you for that question. And I'll add um, something that we can all be doing is to follow the Gorte Land Trust and other indigenous groups on social media. And it's a good thing to do for two reasons. One, you can learn a lot, right, by following these groups. Um, and you can use that as part of your own self-education, uh, but you can also share, right, share all that information with your networks. And so amplifying the messages that are coming directly from indigenous groups is a really, really wonderful way to support um, support that work. And with respect to Good Guest Kensington um, specifically, so you know we're a scrappy little group uh, that is just getting started, and the more folks that we have who can um, respond to to asks and take on tasks, uh, the more that we can do. So right now, as I said, um, we're trying to distribute posters to just create more awareness and visibility for this work. And so if you'd like to grab a few posters and take them to some shops or uh, community groups around town, that's a great way to help us. Um, and getting on our email list is another wonderful thing to do because that way you'll find out about future opportunities. And um, whether you wanna communicate by email or come to one of our meetings, uh, just work with us to come up with the next set of projects and programs that we're going to create to keep educating our community about this really, really transformative work and, um, you know, just take on more ambitious projects. I feel like um, it was just chatting with 
Ariel earlier about the progress we've made already. Um, in March, we had 30 Kensington residents who had paid Shiumi. And just this month, Ariel, we're up to 50. So that's a really big increase in a short amount of time, but there's also so many more of our neighbors that we could encourage and invite to participate in this really beautiful work. Um, so yeah, send us an email and uh, we'll put you on the list and it would be really wonderful to work with you. Laura, I'd like to say one more thing about that. I, um, the way Shumi has been set up is that it's an invitation for an ongoing relationship. So. Uh, you know, it's not one of those things where you do it and then you're done because you've done it. Um, but the invitation is to really think about um, making that contribution every year as an ongoing relationship as long as you live on this land and in this territory. And what that has done for um, the tribe and for the Segorate Land Trust is create a very local and sustainable basis of support so that... Um, the work isn't dependent on government grants or the whims of the foundation philanthropy world or, um, you know, selling things or any other kind of, um, you know, hustle, right, to, to fund the work that needs to happen. Um, Shiumi is a really powerful way that the community here can support the indigenous women led rematriation initiatives and programs that the land trust is doing. So paying yourself you know, for yourself and your family is obviously the invitation. Engage your neighbors, the school, you know, we're, we're at the library, right? Like all these things. And there's also a, a layer of um, invitation to institutions. So that's for um, nonprofits, businesses, schools, religious organizations, um, you know, any institution or organization that is based and operates on Lashana Lodi land, there is also an invitation to make a sh contribution to the Shumi land tax. So um, your place of employment, right? Like any of the places. Um, and again, this is, the vision is to um, create a long-term sustainable source of support for this work that is um, so valuable for, for all of us. Thanks, Ariel. Um, and I see, I, I wanna make sure and call out um, something that Anne Harlow uh, has dropped into the chat um, because Anne is part of a group um, right here in Kensington, the Unitarian Universalist Church. Um, they have a group honoring indigenous peoples and you can go, um, Anne has dropped that URL um, into the chat and you can go to their website and look at the really beautiful resources that that, that community is cultivating. So it's great to have in this tiny town of Kensington, two groups who are focused on supporting indigenous sovereignty. Um, and then Anne has also asked a question, well, a few really good ones, I don't know how many we'll be able to get to. Um, will there be a protest in Emeryville on Black Friday this year? Do you know, Ariel? I have not heard anything about it. So I'm not, I'm not sure actually that's gonna happen. It might not. Um, for those uh, who don't know, um, the Bay Street Mall in Emeryville, in Ikea, right down there by, five, uh, by 880 um, in Emeryville is, was built on the largest shell mound. Um, you might have noticed that the street, there is Shell Mound Street and Ohlone Way um, down there in Emeryville. That was a shell mound that was like 65 feet tall and bigger than a city block. And, um, and it was destroyed about 100 years ago to build a paint factory. And in the 1990s, the city of Emeryville um, developed it into the Bay Street Mall. Karina and Janela actually protested that development. They said, you know, this is our, this is an ancestral burial ground. Please don't build this mall. Um, and the city of Emeryville saw dollar signs and went ahead and did it anyway. So for the last 20 something years, they've been holding a um, public protest and prayer gathering on Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, down there, right there at the, what is the fake shell mound? Cause that tiny little mound with the fountain with the metal basket, I don't know if you've seen it, is a complete distortion of what shell mounds used to be. It's, that thing is tiny. 
Um, but folks have been gathering for the last 20 years every Black Friday there to let people know and also to pray because there are still ancestral remains underneath that mall all over that area. Um, because of COVID, the last couple of years have been, um, you know, uh, on pause. And I don't know uh, if that's happening this year. I, I suspect it might not be because um, it didn't happen last year. Um, but the ongoing invitation uh, from Karina and the tribe is to go down to the West Berkeley Shell Mound at your own time, at any time you have, and to offer your prayers in whatever way that feels right to you. Karina has, has made this public invitation to all of us to, to recognize that this the, the West Berkeley Show Mount at 4th Street is still a sacred site. And um, she's, offered, she's offered the invitation for people to tie ribbons on the fences, to bring flowers. People have brought signs. You can see this on um, Facebook or Instagram from the Save the West Berkeley Show Mount accounts. Um, and to just go and spend a little bit of time there. Um, so that is, that is something that everyone can do um, and, uh, and is a, in a beautiful way also. In addition to you know, financial and political and other ways of leverage, just go down to the site and spend a little time there. And we've got just about two minutes left. I'm gonna acknowledge one other uh, exchange that happened in the chat. Um, and then we'll close and go to the last slide so you can make sure to get information about Good Guest Kensington. Um, so Ariel gave a really beautiful land acknowledgement at the beginning of this program and you're probably hearing more and more about land acknowledgements. Um, and it's really important to understand the purpose of a land acknowledgement and how to do them in a good way. And uh, Sigourte Land Trust just published a guide uh, to land acknowledgements. So that will be in the resource sheet, um, which Sigrid just popped into the chat. So please take a look at that. Um, I hope you find it helpful. Uh, please share it with other people um, as you're having this conversation and inviting people into the work. And again, just a really warm invitation uh, to anybody uh, who's in Kensington to join us at Good Guest Kensington. Um, you can join the email list and hang out and see what it's all about for a while if you want. Um, you can write to us with feedback, questions, ideas. Um, of course, just invite you to keep talking to your neighbors as well. Um, our core team meets on the second Monday of each month from 7 to 8 p.m. And while the regular crew that meets um, is, a, is the core team. Um, everybody's welcome. So just, you could just pop in and hear what we're talking about and um, share your thoughts. So um, I just wanna say thank you again for choosing to spend an hour uh, of your time with us learning about this. Um, thanks, Ariel. And thanks again, Kensington Library and Kara. And um, I think Ariel and I'll hang on for another minute or two if anybody wants to chat, but just um, lots of gratitude for you showing up and have a great night. Yes, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Ariel. And thank you everyone for joining us this evening. It was um, very informative and I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for coming, Meldon. Easy to tell by your accent. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you just so deeply for this session. Um, I've learned some things. Uh, things I should have learned when I was young. And um, I'm just so, so grateful for this opportunity. Thank you all so, so much. Thank you for coming. Um, I have an extra poster, so I put it on the kiosk um, on, at Arlington and Amherst. I guess you can't hear oh, me. Oh, is this Anne? Yeah. Hey, Anne.
Hi, can you hear me okay? I have something going on with my microphone. Um, yeah, pretty pretty well. There, um, I noticed there hasn't been a poster on the kiosk there by the um, Roxacool. Um, should I just keep putting them up uh, as they disappear? <laughs> Well, we, we realized that the reason they kept disappearing is because they were too big and there are very specific rules. And oh. there are people who police right. the materials yeah. quite rigorously. So I think it's on our list of things to do to create a smaller size. And when we have that, Anne, I can let you know and you can, you can post it back up there. Okay. Thank you for taking that on. Okay, well, here I am. Look at this. There you <laughs> are, live. This Thanks for coming. It's a, um, it's a 1898 painting, watercolor, looking down towards the bay uh, from like the El Cerrito Hills. And the um, uh, Cerrito Creek is winding its way down, which is our border between um, Kensington and Berkeley. And Did you? Did you paint that? No, I just found it on the web someplace. And because um, I'm into local history, like the music and stuff. It's a it beautiful like background. The land before the European Spring. Great. All right. Well, thank well, you, everybody, for coming. So glad to um, spend a little time with you all and look forward to being in conversation and relationship. Ariel, with you. don't forget about the church. Property. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. All right, everyone. Good okay. Night. Good night, everybody. Good to see you. Good guest folk. Talk to you guys later. Good night, everybody. Thank you.